Brett and Vivian, composer for 1883 Paramount Plus series, a prequel to Yellowstone. Brett, and I know you worked on this score with, with Brian Tyler. You guys worked together on Yellowstone as well. I, I wanted to start there. How did you approach, No, having worked together on Yellowstone, how did you want to go into approaching 1883, I guess, to start? Yeah, so a lot of the ideas from Yellowstone just carried on through and we just wanted to explore it further. So for Yellowstone, it was a lot of trying to take a lot of the cultural, musical cultures from a lot of the European immigrants coming over. And I think we wanted to explore that more for 1883 and um, look at older older music from from uh, that era. And I think also, you know, one of the things we wanted to do was uh, that we liked doing was picking a few signature instruments from that sort of part of the world and kind of, I like this idea of, you know, if you're on a wagon and you're a family, you might bring a, a small instrument that you can take with you across to America and, and across to the West. And, you know, maybe it's a bit beaten up. It doesn't sound quite as in tune. And you sort of have this reflecting of the land and the hardships that they're going through uh, present within the instruments and the music. That's awesome. So for that, then had you find the instruments and like do you obviously i can't imagine there's a lot of instruments left over from 1883 let's say maybe so like do you have to like yeah. how do you like make it sound like it is from like old 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 times and stuff oh uh, yeah so we did things like um you know putting a really heavy mute on a on a fiddle uh things like um you know just playing in a different a different manner um also doing things like putting, you know, having a normal kind of flamenco guitar, but preparing it by putting, you know, sticking picks in it. So it sort of has this kind of dead quality to the sound, that, that sort of stuff. Did you guys try to like actually thematically connect the music for 1883 to what you had done previously on Yellowstone? So like if somebody was like, obviously I'm sure you could watch the show separate from each other, but if you're a fan of Yellowstone, you're going to watch 1883. Are you trying to like get people to evoke like, oh, I, I, I'm going to sound similar to Yellowstone or, or something like that? Yeah, I think definitely there is like a kind of, um, you know, sonic quality that is, for, you know, it lives within the world. I think the difficulty was, you know, honoring the yellow sign sound, but also trying something new. And um, I think you'll, I think when you listen to it, there's uh, certain instrumentations as well that makes it kind of sound within the universe. And so definitely we try to keep a, a sense of, um, uh, they're in the same world, but distinct at the same time. So let us start with like the main theme for 1883. What were your like, had you had you come up with the, the melody and stuff? And like, what was like that process like, I guess? Yeah, so Brian handled the main theme. I think his main, uh, you know, approach for that was to really look at the story of, of um, you know, them going traveling over and there's a sense of like, sadness and and um heroicness and stoicism that i think you wanted to try and you know replicate within the sound yeah so you've worked together with brian frequently obviously and obviously mm. co-composers on this and, and yellowstone as well what is i guess where that relationship start I, I start there and then like we could i would love to know how you guys work together but how did you guys like yeah. hook up i guess first well so i i worked for, for him as an assistant for a while and he you know would hear stuff that i would write um i think the thing that he liked most was uh, the fact that I would record myself playing guitar. And so um, when Yellowstone came around, it, it sort of felt like a perfect fit for us to do together. Um, and so a lot of the sounds, I ended up stealing a lot of his instruments because he, he has like things like Creek Bazooki and that ended up being in the score. So, um, and I was able to play it to a certain extent because, you know, it's, it's easier to translate than, you know, Say doing a fiddle or something like that and so I that's how I got on board with it and I think kind of our general tastes were in the same area and we kind of just knew how to approach it the same way. And then from a working perspective how do you got are you like constantly in contact when you're writing like how does it work how does that process come together for you guys? Yeah so yeah definitely in contact and like you know, he'll listen to stuff and I'll listen to his stuff. And, you know, we'll, we'll, there's a lot of a back and forth uh, with the music. And, you know, sometimes you'll be going down a route that you're not sure about. And, and then, uh, you know, Brian will say to me, yeah, keep going, you know, make it even crazier or weirder. And, and so it's, it's nice to have that 
uh, you know, back and forth with them. So obviously Taylor Sheridan is such a, a creative, like a creative force on the, the Yellowstone franchise. Certainly. I would love to know, like, I think what done Yellowstone in 1883 here, like what, what is his approach to music and what does he like tell you guys what kind of feedback do you get from how does that kind of collaboration come together? And like, what is, what is he saying about like what you guys are doing musically? Honestly, I, I think the most important about it thing about it is he just trusts us, you know, and he gives us, you know, when he gives us feedback, it's, you know, it's, you know, broader things that, you know, that can be changed. And so it's nice to have someone that, you know, really digs the sound and lets us do our thing. And, you know, if there's stuff that needs changing, it's, it's not, it's not huge tonal shifts. It's more like, you know, just things here and there. And so it's nice to have someone that, you know, listens to a lot of music and really knows music and, and seems to dig when we take, you know, risks and, uh, appreciates uh, our input. You've done a good deal of, of contemporary music, obviously, and this is a, a Western genre, not necessarily something you guys have done a lot of, certainly. I, what Do you go back and, like, I mean, I, I it's definitely unique to Yellowstone, certainly, but do you go back and, like, look at other Westerns, or, like, how does that come, like, from a inspiration standpoint, or you're like, oh, like, do you try to, like, file things away, like, when you're watching other genres, or how do you, like, yeah. think about it in, in regards to its genre, basically? I think so Taylor really didn't want to do the the cliche Western type thing. And so in a way it was sort of, that was an inspiration of something not to do and to, to kind of, uh, you know, go somewhere different. I think for us, it was more kind of the, the idea of, okay, let's take it from, you know, all these European immigrants moving over. And I think that was really the spark that ignited the kind of, the tone for the show, the this sort of world building of character that you know these these instruments that uh, and cultures, musical language that a lot of these European immigrants would have brought over. Did you have like a specific scene or character that you were like very excited to uh, put music to or anything like any theme or anything? Um, I think, yeah, I think like uh, well, the whole the whole show follows you know. It's it's a it's a band of like a lot of different people, and so I I really like this idea of, you know, uh, writing for the hopes of them as a collective, and kind of how you can connect each individual person as as a whole. Um, I think was just really really interesting, and in how you know as as that they lose hope and you know have discontent and and all this sort of stuff. How does that reflect as as uh, them as a group within the music I thought was really interesting yeah I was looking at something that Brian had said recently he was talking about being a composer and he was like oh one of the only the, uh he's the only way to grow as a composer is to keep learning something new which I thought was like really interesting and obviously like you've got a wealth of experience certainly he does as well like with this like so what did you learn I guess new doing this that you're like excited to take to the next project yeah would you say I, I mean, it was a lot of music this time, and and because you, with Yellowstone, you can there's a lot of um, uh, source music as well, and and I think with this, it's such a grand and epic scale, and uh, I'd really never done anything on that scale before, and and to that quantity of music, so I think it was a real lesson in in how to handle such a grand scope of narrative uh, musically, and how the music morphs, and and writing lots of different themes for different characters. Um, yeah, and how to approach it that way. What's it like, I mean, just like basic, like what's the recording process like for something like this? Cause obviously it is, it seems like yeah. probably pretty complicated. I don't know, like what is it like? Yeah, so there's a lot of, I mean, we started off with the big theme and some of the cues uh, from, from episode one, but there's also a lot of recording of live musicians and uh, just soloists here and there. And then um, Brian and I also record ourselves playing. And so it's sort of this kind of jumbled up uh, different uh, sizes of recording uh, that happens throughout the whole thing. Yeah, well, it's, it's a really great score. Uh, 1883, you can listen to it on Spotify. The show is on Paramount Plus. You can watch all the episodes now. Brett and Vivian, thank you so much for doing this. Appreciate it. Bless you. Thank you, mate. Nathan Barr, an Emmy winner for Hollywood along with four other nominations who's wrote the great music for the Hulu comedy series, The Great. Uh, Nathan, uh, coming into season two of the show, what were your overall goals for the music, I guess? And love to start there. And, and what were your thoughts basically coming in? 
I mean, I have two like amazing collaborators on the show uh, in Tony McNamara and Marianne uh, McGowan. Um, they're both just amazing people to work with. They they love music. They understand the role music is uh, supposed to play on the show. And the tricky thing about The Great has always been to the tone of it. Um, uh, in the beginning, when I came out on season one, it was like this knife's edge, right? Where we could walk. We could get too hokey too quickly or uh, too heavy handed and... So I think the thing that gelled between us was just sort of an understanding of, of what the show needed to be tonally. And then the performances really sort of define that as well. I think Al and Nick are just both amazing. Um, so yeah, it was just sort of to continue the journey. We had uh, uh, Al's mother show up, uh, had a great cameo this season, which was really fun. Um, and so, yeah, that's, that's kind of the, the deal. So like, does it like, I guess... Do you get the scripts for like how did like are you immediately like when you I, get the scripts you're like thinking about like right away like how it could sound and, and how does that come together? I mean, I just uh, I I rarely read the scripts because I like to experience the show as a fan. I've I've always made that my practice. Um, if I like the show and I could just sort of see it for the first time during spotting, I get to enjoy the actual show as a as an audience member. And I think bringing that enthusiasm and excitement to the scoring process is really helpful uh, uh, for me. So, so uh, unless there's like a pre-record or something, uh, which there are a couple of this season, um, then I then I don't read the scripts. There were two couple of great scenes in sequence uh, or sequences this season. One is the sort of what we call the sex dance between Nick uh, Nick and Al, um, and that that needed to be pre-recorded. Uh, so uh, my assistant Harry played viola, violin. I played cello. Uh, and then that was sent to the set and they learned it, danced to it. And that was really cool. Uh, and then there's a, a rag dance, we call, which is where they're um, skating along the floor in the beginning, the the servants uh, polishing the floors with the rags tied to their feet. Uh, and that was another one that was done to the music. So, yeah. I love the sex dance cue. I was listening again this morning. All of your, It's a great <laughs> score to listen to just in general. But I was like, oh, and it's like so good. And I was, it perked up and I was like, what is this one called again? And uh, I guess, can you talk about that? Because I think it's so great. I'm like, what were your inspirations for that or whatever? I just love that cue. It's, and it's so, it's not very long and it makes such an no. impact, obviously. Yeah, I mean, and their, and their choreography is so like wonderfully goofy and fun and so they really rose to the task of the choreographer and the and, and the two of them. Um, so, I mean, you know, it's always like, right, it's just super under the deadline. We need this tomorrow. So half the time you're not thinking about it. You just know the show. You've absorbed the show. And, and I, I think I just sat down and whistled something to Harry, the tune, and he started playing it. And I started playing the chords on the cello and recorded it and sent it in in half an hour, which is when they needed it. So. <laughs> It it's was amazing. okay. Sometimes those are the coolest things though, right? You know, when you can't overthink it, you just got to do it. And, and I think all of us on this call as film composers are, uh, TV composers are really, uh, are, you have to be good at that. Yeah. So you mentioned like the show is obviously on that like razor's edge and stuff, I guess, like, I don't know, do you learn, like, are you more confident in the, in the way you're writing music for season two, having known the tone is so right in season one and like, kind of like, how did that help this season? <clears throat> I mean, the hardest part about this show is that the score is broken up into so many cues. So I think last last season we had an episode with like uh, 20, 20 or 22 minutes of music and th and it was broken up into 30 cues. So it's a, it's a lot of work um, and the overall impact of the score is there, but it's just broken up a lot. So um, I would say um, that's the, the the most challenging thing about about working on the show. And it's that's just the nature of the show, right? There are a lot of segues in and segues out and uh, and transitions. And then when a cue actually shows up on my plate, that's like a minute or a minute and a half. I'm so excited. End of last season, they said, I think we're going to do a main title season two. I'm like, that's fantastic. I'm like, what, what are we looking at? 60 seconds, 90 seconds. They're like, oh, we're looking at nine seconds, like <laughs> nine seconds. So that's definitely like the shortest main title I've written. I've written some short ones before, but uh, but, you know, it's like a challenge. Right. So I I wrote something pretty crazy, busy and uh, and insane, uh, which was, I think, exactly right for the show, uh, given the crazy energy of the characters this season. But it but it, but it, it was pretty funny to, uh, to to only get nine seconds to do so. It's it's pretty. I mean, like that's so wild. Like, is this as a com you like I said, you've done like many different shows and like a lot of success as a composer. Are you like filing away things or like how does that like? Are you like oh like do you like have little snippets where you're something like oh like nine seconds I can maybe I thought of this like seven months ago I maybe I could do it or something. How does that come together for you? 
Yeah, no, again, I think it's just more by the seat of your pants, just running with it. Like I rarely have an idea that gets tossed in, in something that comes up later. Um, so uh, yeah, so this was again, one of those things where they needed it like yesterday and, and I had like, you know, an afternoon to write it and I just really quickly wrote it. And, uh, but I, I, again, I think there's something when you're uh, put on the spot uh, in such a way, I think it more more often than not, it yields really good results. I didn't know before I got into this business, if I was good with pressure and deadlines and all that. And as it turns out, you know, I would get nothing done without pressure and deadlines. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's good when you have a, you know, proverbial, you know, when you're under the gun, I guess it does, yeah, it does yeah. help a little bit. Yeah, to exactly. Get it. Exactly. Yeah. So obviously, like the the show is historical fiction or whatever you want to call it. It's like yeah. you know, it's not not beholden to, to history though. It is based on history. Just yep. like, are you? I mean, maybe not based on what you're saying, but do you go back? Like, are you thinking of the era musically, or how do you kind of like try to reflect that versus like what you're doing with the score? Because it doesn't. It obviously sounds like to me as a as a per- novice and not an expert in, in history. I'm like, oh, it sounds like something that could, is is appropriate for the time, but also in a modern sense. So how do yeah. you kind of like try to balance that? I think again, that was like how I came to the show was they had, they had auditioned a bunch of different people and um, were having trouble um, getting, getting, lifting it out of strict period into something more contemporary. So my demo to them was like a violin with a bunch of synth, which they really liked. Um, I just uh, sort of threw out the, the rule book. Uh, So yeah, it's just really about, um, I love Tony's sensibility around the story, right? He takes these historical characters kind of squints at them and then does like kind of whatever the hell he wants with them. And I think that's partly why the show is such a success and so funny and appealing and surprising. And, and, and so the score, you know, follows suit. So there's definitely like a lot of like anachronistic, like synth stuff happening with the orchestra uh, throughout the show, which I think again, lifts it above the sort of straight period approach, which, which the show is not. And therefore the music doesn't want to be either. Um, Yeah. Yeah. You mentioned watching it as a fan too. Obviously the Catherine and Peter relationship is so complex. How do you like, you know, how, how are you writing music to that and making sure like they're like, are you reflecting their relationship and the tension of their relationship in the score, I guess? Yeah. I mean, I think again, because it's all these short little cues, it's not a traditional show where there are a lot of like very specific themes for specific characters. And I didn't know that going in, but just as I've been writing, like it's really, every cue on some level is a new thing in the show. And that's what it wants. I don't know why it wants that necessarily, but um, I'm certainly their relationship is one of the things like, he's just so completely arrogant and uh, misogynistic and and horrible. Um, And yet he's got, uh, you know, he's going to help have a child with her. And so that, that, that sort of emotionally connects her to him. And so, yeah, it is an incredibly complicated and I think tied again together in that sex dance where it's, where it's like, you know, it's this constant push, pull, push, push, pull, pull. It's playful. It's dark. He's going to kill her, but then he loves her. And uh, so, yeah, the score needs to needs to reflect all that. You mentioned that sex dance again, but is there a, a, a was there a cue or something that you were like really excited by or proud of beyond like that one for this season? I mean, the the uh, Catherine's mother. Um, uh, <laughs> that sex scene with Peter where she then goes out the window <laughs> at the end. <laughs> It's kind of a really fun uh, and and uh, a bizarre cue to write, uh, and that 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 allowed me to use kind of the full orchestra in a way, and then also um, uh, with synth elements. So yeah, I mean, you know, you 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 uh, you just go go as you go as you go, and 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 at the end of the season, take a look back at, at what you've done, and some things stand out more than others, and and there's a lot in this show that I'm really proud of. So, uh, have you already started thinking about what you would do for next season of the show? No, I haven't. Okay. They're, they're, Tony, Tony's writing right now. Uh, he may be through most of it and they're going to start shooting soon, but I have no uh, thoughts at this point about it. I mean, one of the things that's really, the score is really, and the, and the process of the dub is very dynamic. So uh, just because I've written it and they've signed off on it doesn't mean it's going to go on the show. You know, they, they very much watch it with fresh ears, fresh eyes from a story perspective on the dub stage. So regularly I'll write stuff, which, which, rightfully so they decide oh we don't we don't need this little heavy handed here or we do need this thing here um so there's a there's a real fluidity uh and, and uh uh in in the in the dialogue between us and the, and the process of getting the music into the show that's that's uh challenging and exciting when that happens do you like 
if they're not going to use something, do you save it for something else or how, yeah, you heard, hopefully. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Hopefully I do. And, and sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't, but yeah, hopefully that's the, yeah, that's the case. And and there are some really interesting instruments this season as well. There's a, something called a heckle phone, which is a sort of a, a strange cousin, I guess, of the bassoon. Uh, and that, that shows up uh, with the ambassador uh, in, the, in, the, in this, along with the baritone, electric baritone guitar. So there's that anachronism again of those yeah. two things together. And it, it, I don't know, it's just cool. It's fun to play with. Most people will never notice, but, but uh, you know, it, in the back of my head, I, I think, uh, oh, that's kind of cool. <laughs> yeah, and it, it's, it's, it's excellent to listen to as well. Uh, Nathan Barr, composer for The Great. Uh, you can watch all the episodes on Hulu. Thank you so much for doing this. Thank you. Siddhartha Kolsla, Emmy nominee for This Is Us and also the composer on Only Murders in the Building. Uh, Sid, I, I love both of these scores. I wanted to start with uh, Only Only Murders. It's a great mystery show with lots of twists and turns. I guess when you first like read the scripts and stuff, how did that inform you know how you thought the music should sound? Yeah, I mean, I read that first script and um, and it was totally something that was you know, up my alley in terms of the wheelhouse that I like to sort of live in. It's, 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 it's that perfect balance between comedy and drama. Um, there was a bunch of magical realism sort of like baked into the script. Um, and so I knew that there was going to be a lot of sort of like, this could be a lot of fun to actually score this. And um, I could be as sort of creative as, as I wanted to be. And, and I knew that John Hoffman who created the show um, was also going to be really open to sort of just something like fresh and original and different. And, um, and he let me sort of explore, which was great. Um, interestingly enough, when, uh, when I got the, when I got, when I had that interview for the show, we were sort of like, we were like deep in the sort of like the early parts of the pandemic when everything was sort of shutting down. Um, and I had started writing my own modern classical record. Um, you know, it was just like all the production stopped and, you know, I didn't, I didn't train in any classical, um, I, I, I come from the band world. Um, I was in a band, singer, songwriter of a band, um, like an indie alternative rock band. Um, uh, not very successful band, by the way. Um, but the, uh, so for me, I was going to, I use this time to sort of start exploring ideas and, and my own sort of interpretation of modern classical and thinking of like sort of people like uh, Philip Glass and um, and and then looking back to like people like Satie and and so there was just a lot of listening I was doing and writing and just for my for myself and on my interview with uh, John Hoffman on a zoom call um, I played him like one of the pieces that I had just like written like as I had read his script because I was already in this world and he heard it and he was like you have the job on the show um, and and so that was uh, I'd never really done that before and that was exciting um, but uh, but yeah it was just it was just one of those like it's 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 been just like a magical experience working on that show the theme is so incredibly catchy and excellent I, I love it so much and I, I it obviously you. you weave it through the whole score but how did you come up with the, the theme for that and like I guess one of the things I was curious about too is like the show is obviously like, you know, a true crime kind of spoofing and like relies on the audience's familiarity with true crime podcasts and all these different things. So, I mean, how like, yeah. I feel like your score evokes those kind of shows, but also it's so original. And I guess, how did you kind of like make, like blend it all together to get that, that main theme? Yeah, I, I think for me, I heard this melody and, um, and it was da, 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 da. Da, 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 da. It was just like this line that I had, and um, and I ended up just sort of like I I came up with just something that was just uh, fun for me. Like it was just and I, and it was no I had no idea that would actually end up being the theme. Um, and I played it for John, and basically it was like me hitting these like quarter note stabs really high on the piano, um, very much sort of inspired by my old band days of like you know, of uh, Brian Wilson and uh, Donovan sort of inspired stuff, like very sort of 60s-esque, um, just this bouncy quarter note thing that I was doing. And I sang this melody over these changes. Um, and, um, and then John heard it and he was like, that's my show right there. And, and he said the score for that, that theme that I'd written made him feel um, equal parts um, sort of uh, comedic um, as it felt dramatic to him. It felt mysterious. 
Um, and he thought that it could really sort of help him in like the magical realism stuff that he wanted to explore in series. And he just loved that melody against the changes that I had. And um, the one thing he asked was, you know, the producers asked was, how do you make this more New York? You know, so like this show takes place in New York City um, in this um, pre-war building called the Arconia. And, um, you know, you have this entire, you have Steve Martin, Martin Short, Selena Gomez, and all these other incredible actors, many of them theater actors, um, who sort of like live in this building. And, um, and the idea was, how do we bring about the majesty of this pre-war building and the history of it in the score, but also um, juxtapose it with something modern? Um, because, you know, New York is filled with all of these sort of like, um, uh, this, this, these, these dichotomies of sort of like rich and poor, um, socioeconomic disparity. You know, you can go down one hallway in the Arconia and you can have somebody who lives in this building that's so wealthy um, and then somebody that's grandfathered into sort of like, you know, uh, a rent controlled situation that has been living there forever. Um, and then you can walk down the street and there can be somebody on the street corner just, you know, playing buckets um, um, to, to collect change. And that's when I said to John, I said, well, why don't we um, have um, Home Depot buckets on the main title? And my drummer, James uh, McAllister, who's fantastic and plays with Sufjan Stevens and the National and a bunch of bands that I love. Um, I asked him if he could just go get some Home Depot buckets and he did and he set up his drum kit with mics on the, all these buckets and just sort of and just played on the main title and it really was the thing that made it sort of like um, you know slap as some people have said to me is a new <laughs> word a new, a new word that I've learned. Yes uh, it does it does slap yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but I think it's I think it slaps because of James. I mean it's like when he added those drums in, it was like, so when you hear the, when the main title comes on, it prelapsed with that's him on Home Depot buckets. Wow. And it really was the thing that gelled it together. Um, and then that, as you said, that theme is something that I wove throughout series, but in a, in a much larger orchestral sort of way. Yeah, it's wonderful. I, last one on Only Murders and we'll get to This Is Us, but how much of your background as like you said, like indie rock and obviously you like, you like all those bands, but this is a classical score. How much is that, Influ like how much does your indie rock roots basically influence the class the way you think of classical music I think for me I'm very melody driven it's always been just like the way that I write it was the way I wrote songs in my band it's the way I write scores now like I read a script and um, I hear melody right away it's sort of like I approach scripts like I'm writing I, I approach these shows like I'm um, uh, you know like I'm I'm a songwriter as much as I'm a composer um, and, and that helps me sort of think of things around theme and melody. Um, I'm a huge fan of, um, of, of, of having a theme that goes through series um, that can permeate um, through different experiences that the characters are having. So that theme that I wrote ended up, oddly enough, it, like it worked, you know, obviously I would have to sort of contextualize it with with uh, with an orchestra and 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 orchestrate it accordingly, but it seemed to work in like really romantic moments. It seemed to work in even really dark moments, mysterious moments, um, and 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 so when I had that theme, I think it was the nature of the changes. Um, that melody, I sort of reharmonized with sort of a bunch of minor chords. Um, sometimes that minor, that same minor chord, we'd go from D minor to D major. Um, over the same change and that sort of would like feel slightly unsettled. Um, so for me, it came with melody first. Um, and, um, and I also had like wonderful sort of like orchestrating team. You know, you can't do this all by yourself. It's like a lot of work and it's, it's a heavy lifting show. And we had like, you know, this sometimes there's wall to wall score on the show. Um, and, um, but you know, some of the orchestrators um, that have worked on the show, um, um, there's one guy that, you know, did a lot of work with Wes Anderson and he's been wonderful helping me on the show. And, and so collectively we, we sort of, um, we sort of made this happen. Yeah. And uh, just to, this is us here. You're obviously already a three-time Emmy nominee for the show uh, for your music in, in different capacities. Emmy losing. Emmy losing. Emmy losing. And yeah. a three-time yeah. Emmy loser. Uh, but no. So going into the final season, you how did you, like, what are the goals of the music? How do you approach, like, are you trying to do something new? Like, what was like, what was the idea, I guess? Um, this is us is, is a very sort of like special show. Um, it, it's it's close to my heart. Um, 
uh, you know, Dan Fogelman, who created the show, he and I have been friends since we were freshmen in college. So I've known him longer than I haven't. Um, and, and that show is sort of like informed by his own tragedy that he experienced in his life when he, he's been open about how he lost his mom at a young age. And, um, and so I've sort of seen Dan through some of these like ups and downs of his life. And so working on this show has been um, an incredibly, it's an incredible, incredible bonding experience for he and I, because in many ways I'm scoring for my friend as much as I am the characters on the screen. Um, and, and so there's a very sort of meta experience I have with that show. The show's about this larger connectivity of life. It's about these decisions we make um, that sometimes are seemingly benign, but then have these huge impacts on us and our future generations. Um, and so I, I brought in a lot of my own childhood the score is really, really Indian. I mean, if like, if you're Indian and you hear that score, you're like, this makes me feel like old classical Hindi music. Um, there's all these sort of like, da, 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 na, 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 like these sort of like lines that I'm singing that feel um, like they could have come out of some old classical um, Indian song. And so for me to be able to use that sort of part of my childhood into the score and also write music for my friend and it'd be like on like a network television show like for an NBC show um, is not something you get to do that often um, and and Dan and I, it's been such a creatively rewarding experience um, I actually like I I I cried twice in my studio this week on like I wrote the final cue and the, the, not the cue didn't make me cry I don't want to be that sort of egotistical but it was like it was just as I finished it, I was like, oh, my gosh, like this show has done so much for my career. Uh, it's been such a wonderful experience. I'm never going to get to do this again. So, yeah, anyway, well, the cue, I'm not going to cry again. So I'll stop. Well, the cue might not make you cry, but I guarantee you people who watch this as us will cry because of, of your music in those <laughs> final episodes. Uh, Siddhartha Kolsla, Kolsla, excuse me, the composer of Only Murders in the Building, which is on Hulu. And this is us on NBC. You can listen to the scores on Spotify and all streaming platforms. Thank you so much for doing this. Thanks. Daniel Pemberton, an Oscar nominee for The Trial of Chicago 7, an Emmy nominee for Black, Black Mirror, whose score for Welcome to Earth is on Nat Geo, all episodes streaming on Disney+. Plus. Uh, I'm sure there are a lot of places you could start with this score and, and this project. Like, How did you approach it uh, coming in for a nature docuseries like this? Where, where'd you start? I think you know one of the big things about this, this, this series is it doesn't feel like any other nature doc series. I think partly because of Darren Aronofsky's involvement and the way he sort of visualized like th this whole series had to feel very different. And that's kind of what got me excited about it because I wanted, always want to do something different. And a lot of this for me was like seeing the world in a way you've never seen it before. And so I wanted the music to um, have that same sense of the unexpected, the unusual. So you know, when you're seeing anything from a volcano to like a tiny cell on a plant, I wanted the music to be very uh, like different to what you'd heard before in nature documentaries. So that was a big thing because I wanted, when you have music that tells you, hey, here's that thing you've heard before. Here's a big brass chord that goes like this. Well, I actually got brass sound up here, you know. Here's, here's a big magnificent uh, mountain. So it's going to be like, I didn't want to do that. I wanted it to be, like a sound and, a, and a, an approach that made you go, hang on, what, what, what's going on here? And so you engage with the story and the environment in a different way. So are you starting that from when you get the visuals? Like, how do you approach it? Cause like, you're right. Like when I watch the show and then even listen back to your score, I'm like, this sounds almost otherworldly at times. And like, obviously like the visuals are stuff like I've never seen before either. It's just an incredible, the, the, the cinematography is unbelievable and everything. So how did you like, where do you start, I guess, from there? I mean, it's a bit of everything with this show. I mean, like, yeah, the cinematography on this series is absolutely mind blowing. And every time you get some new stuff in, you'd be like, oh, my God, this is amazing. Like, where is this even real? Like, there's a bit where there's a car driving. There's the one with the car driving over the mirror lake. And you're like, how, how does this even make sense? Um, I, so what I would do is I, I started writing early on. I try to create a palette of sounds. I sort of try to create an orchestra out of non-orchestral elements it was you know it was trying to try to create sounds and textures and and um sort of instruments that i would kind of create and build myself out of sounds of nature of wildlife of electronics and things that that felt unconventional 
And then I would, sometimes I would, I would look at visuals and use that as inspiration and then start writing blind. Um, sometimes I would write stuff very specifically to picture. It was a very fluid edit on this series. So I found I would often get the best results by watching things, being inspired by, you know, the amazing cinematography, being inspired by the, the world they were showing, and then writing a piece of music for that, but away from it. And then as the show progressed, we'd start like fine tuning things and then start pulling them together more. What, for, what was like the weirdest sound for lack of a better question, like of that you were found or that you were like excited to use in the score? Um, it's, 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 this is a weird one because I've been collecting sounds for years, right? Like I, I build and try and make as much of my own um, sounds on projects. And so any, any, time I go away, you know, a gravitate player, well, I, I, you know, even the iPhone, like actually this, one of the things I'm most proud of is the fact that this iPhone is a very battered, broken one. I, I have a fancy newer one. But I've recorded lots of stuff on this to the extent that even the film yesterday, the Danny Boyle film, features a cue, which is literally taken off voice memos, a guitar <laughs> part, off this, no mixing, and it's in a Hollywood film. So you can get great stuff off these. And so I will record, I remember being in Oslo, and I was in a sculpture park in Oslo, and it was snowing, and uh, there's this weird metal sculpture that had just the most amazing reverb. So I was just like, right, I'm going to stand in here and make lots of strange noises, whistles, shouts, calls. Um, and then I'll just record them. And then one day they will come in handy. And guess what? They did about four years later for this show. Um, so this show allowed me to sort of plunder this, like my own sort of travels in sound over uh, around the world um, and sort of pull all those sort of ideas together. So, I mean, there's so many different things. There's like a load of water recordings I'd sort of made on holiday. Um, I mean, I should probably get Nat Geo to put in the budget, like basically to fly me around the world, just going to cool places, recording sounds. You could go with the whole show maybe, right? I mean, like this, yeah. Yeah, that would be, that's the one thing that sucked about this show is like, you're, you, I wrote most of this during COVID. So I was just stuck in this room, like for so long. And I'm okay with that, but there's something kind of uh, like masochistic about, being stuck in one room and seeing someone go to try the ends of the earth was some of the most exciting adventures and journeys. It's truly funny. Uh, do you like, is there a different approach when you do a docu-series like this as opposed to a narrative film or is the kind of, is, is it the same, like you're just trying to tell a story? Like how do you, do you separate it at all? Yeah, I mean, every job I do, I try and do very differently. So I, if you, you know, if you're familiar with my other work, but like I always try and make it very different. So, you know, like, you know, right now I've got like in, in sort of the kind of this, this moment, we've got like Slow Horses, which is a spy show, which has got a totally different sound to the after party, which has a totally different sound to, to this, which has a very different sound to Spider-Verse or something. Um, and so I always look at what I feel is right for the project. And then I try and do something where I'm starting afresh with like a whole new palette. And I think one of the things with a doc series like this is it, the, the narrative demands are different to a drama. And there are still narrative demands, you know, like let's say the opening of the, I think it's the first episode where they, you know, they're driving up to this volcano, you're spotting all these kind of things. I need to hit this, we need to get the, you know, the, the, the sense of fear here. We need to get a turning, turning corner when we get into this, but you can write in a different way. And so, I think I kind of embraced the freedom that, that this series gave me that allowed me to sort of be a bit more experimental and, um, you know, play around a bit more. Um, so I, I, I say from that point of view, yeah, this, this was a slightly different approach, but it's different for everything I do, really. Yeah, and that's one of the things I love about your stuff is it always sounds different. Well, you mentioned before Darren Aronofsky is the EP, like, what kind of feedback do you get from him or like, uh, does he have, it feels like he, from looking at his films, it feels like he has a strong sense of music and how like a specific sound maybe, but what was his feedback like? Yeah, I mean, he built like a very big style guide, which I think was very important to the series and the look and the feel of the series. And, 
you know, that had a big impact on how I approached this. And, and one of the reasons I, I agreed to do this series was, was the fact that his style and his approach was not the typical approach for, for you know, what is basically in some ways a nature documentary. And, you know, that involvement is, is what allows you to push the envelope a bit further. Um, and, that, you know, that's kind of what, what I wanted to do with this was, was make this feel unlike any nature documentary you'd seen before and sound like no nature documentary you'd yeah. seen before. You mentioned like how like you you obviously hop around a lot of different genres and stuff. When you do something like this, do you did you learn something on this that didn't you think of to take to the other project, the next project, or like even though if it's going to sound so different or and everything's individualized, like do you how does your learning how do you how do you like grow? I guess. Yeah, I mean the thing that's good about doing a different approach on every trying to do a different approach on every project is you always at the beginning you're like I don't know what the hell I'm doing rather than like oh I know what I'm doing I'm going to do the same thing I did on the other film but I'll just change the noises so. There was a ton of stuff. I mean, one of the things I really loved doing in this film, which is kind of weird, was I was stuck at home. It was COVID. It was very hard to organize musicians or anything. So I ended up doing so much of this kind of on my own. Um, and I like that. I like kind of trying to say, right, limitations. You've got to do everything. No, no leaning on, you know, beautiful orchestras or things like that. And so one of the things I want to do is I want to do some vocals. And I was writing a track. And I was like, you know what? I'm just going to record these myself. Now, I cannot sing. I'm a terrible singer. Okay? And it's not like, oh, I'm a terrible singer. I'm very modest. It's not. I'm shit. I'm awful. <laughs> but I, I was also realizing I needed to record. I wanted to record vocals. So I did a thing where I just tried this technique out, slowing tracks down, singing them in the pitch that I could just about get away with, covering them in auto-tune um, and like pitch correction. Then speeding the tracks back up so i'm then singing in a higher pitch voice and it sounds more unusual and less human again uh, the approach all the way through this was to try and make things feel unusual and unexpected so i didn't want it to feel like a human singing or a terrible film composer singing obviously um and so i did a whole bunch of those and then through this sort of technical jiggery pokery and then sort of degrading it through tapes and things suddenly get these really haunting weird vocals uh, which are in a bunch of the tracks as well and that was a great you know that was just like me messing around trying out a new technique which I would, wouldn't have done on any other show I don't think um, but this one gave me the freedom to do that and I'm like oh that's quite cool so you know there's always little bits or like there's this there's this other synth actually here this synth boom and that that I, I sort of used a bit of it to learn how to program to try and learn how to program that synth and got some really cool kind of unusual sounds out of it. That's awesome. Uh, this this score is awesome. You can listen to it on all streaming services, I guess. And also the show is Welcome to Earth, Nat Geo Show on Disney Plus. Daniel Pemberton, thank you so much for doing this. Thank you. Brett and Vivian, composer for 1883. Nathan Barr, composer for The Great. Siddhartha Kolsla, composer for Only Murders in the Building and This Is Us. And Daniel Pemberton, composer for Welcome to Earth. Thank you all for, for doing this. I, I wanted to start I, I, as a fan of music scores. I can remember the first time I was like, oh, I just loved hearing this score. It was the soundtrack to Rudy for myself. But I was wondering for all of you guys, what was the score or anything that really got you excited about playing music for film and television uh, beyond just like being musicians in general? So, so Breton uh, from 1883, why don't you start? Um. I love uh, Memoirs of a Geisha by John Williams. I think there's something about, something to be said about a guy who's so incredible at writing to kind of pull it back and sort of do something that is slightly more simplistic, but adding the complexity in a way that is kind of nuanced and, and very, you know, unexpected. I always love that score. I just think it's great. Yeah. Nathan, how about you? Uh, a couple, Anton Karras' score to The Third Man. Uh, I just love how simple it is. And it's one instrument, the entire, the score, and it's got a great tune. Uh, and then um, I grew up in New York and there was this local station. And whenever you came back from a commercial break, it played this huge sweeping theme that as a kid, I didn't know what it was, but it was Gone with the Wind. And, and the, the, that tune is, is just so awesome and speaks to the real golden age of film scoring. So those were two early ones for me. Nice. Sid, how about you? Um, Angelo by Lamente, my probably one of my favorites of all time. I, I think his 
score for Twin Peaks um, was um, one of the most haunting pieces of music I've ever heard. And it was all focused around that. Da, 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 Daniel, why don't you jump in next? How about you? I'm very much on Nathan's uh, tip with The Third Man, which I do think is one of the greatest film scores ever written. And <laughs> if you're a film composer, where he's like, I'm going to be really clever. And I'm going to write a film on one instrument. <laughs> and it's completely, really, really, really hard. And I've always wanted to do one. <laughs> I think is like a tenth as good as that. Never got there. It's such such a groundbreaking score for the man but if i was going for a personal one there's tons but i'm just going to throw out there like it's not cool and it can't really is cool but it's not cool in a like underground way it's just blade runner by vangelis i still think for me is a score that sounds like nothing else still um the way there's a mix of um uh like live instrumentation electronics is performed in a way that is very unusual for electronic music and it's very dynamic, it's very performative. Um, and I think it's one of those scores that still, it, 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 I mean, everyone knows how groundbreaking it is, but it just still feels like just like nothing else. And, you know, that was a big influence on uh, One Strange Rock, uh, sorry, Welcome to Earth as well, because, you know, that's the otherworldliness of that score fitted in well with what I was trying to do on this, this project. Yeah. You guys have all written like incredible main themes for these shows also. And just in general in your careers, like going through and you go like load you up on like a streaming service again, the, the, the body of work here is incredible from, from the group of you, I guess. How do you, when you're sitting down to write a main title theme, like, like Nathan, you were saying earlier, you had like nine seconds basically or whatever it was for the great. How do you come up with something that it, it, do you try to come up with something that is like memorable as a main theme or kind of do you, if you try, does that like kind of like kill the vibe or something? I, I actually don't even know how you do it, but all, like I said, all of you have created these incredibly memorable themes. Uh, Brett, and I'll start with you and we'll go around, but like, what do you do when you're sitting down to write a main theme? I don't know. For a theme, it's, it's like, it's like trying to squeeze the last bit of toothpaste out of like the toothpaste in a <laughs> container. I don't know. It takes ages. And sometimes it's just, you know some sort of hook that you can kind of expand into a bigger into a bigger thing um but for me it's always just spending a really long time with the you know measure by measure and then sort of making sure that kind of the whole um you know the the form and structure of it kind of makes sense but then sometimes you just do it in like a couple of minutes and it's it's there so it's there's no like for me there's no like real formula for it it's just sometimes it's a struggle sometimes it's all right nathan how about you yeah i mean i love the challenge of the main title because it's so completely unreasonable the ask right it's like we need you to sum up this entire show experience in nine seconds or 12 seconds or eight or 25 seconds and uh I, I just find that really challenging in an exciting way. So, um, uh, yeah, I, I, and, and as with the great, like I said, like I just, you know, crammed as much crazy, as many notes as possible into there because there's something about that sentiment that really works for Catherine and that show. Um, yeah. But yeah, no, Sid, I, I love, adore the challenge. Sid, how about you? Um, I just like listen to Nate Barr's scores and I just try to copy. <laughs> Um, no, um, the, uh, the main title process is, um, is one of my favorite parts of the process because um, oftentimes when I'm, after I read the script for the pilot, um, I, I, and I think this probably comes out of deep insecurity, like I, I just, I never want anyone temping anything ever. Like, it's just like, it is, because if that, you know, and I mean, I come from the band world. I come from like this school that's been discussed at length here with all these composers who I have deep, deep respect for. Like, I love, you know, um, I've seen, and 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 Brett and I don't please don't please forgive me because I don't I'm not as familiar with your work, but with Daniel and Nathan, like specifically, you guys are sticklers for sounds, you know, and and for and 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 for me, I'm more concerned about a vibe. You know, and that comes from what stuff sounds like um, to me as much as what the melody is. And so the main title is an opportunity to just like write something with no sort of 
where, where the producers for me have no idea what the show's gonna sound like because we've had discussions, sure, but um, it's the freest I can possibly be in terms of creating something for the show. And I normally go all out and then they can hate it. Um, but oftentimes something comes out of it. You know, either the melody comes out of it or they're like, what's that the unexpected thing you were doing? I was not expecting that to happen. And, and then it starts a conversation. So it's my, to me, it's my favorite part of the process. Daniel, how about you? Um, yeah, I mean, I kind of like, I, I was working in like, I sort of worked in TV for like 20 years. Uh, and I learned that for good theme, like, a, like you've got very little time to catch people's attention. So the sound world you create is really important. Because if you can just, if you've got a sound world that's unlike any other, you know, if that's a mix of instruments or a special sound or something, that instantly can say, it's this show. And the best one is when you have a great sound world and then a great hook or melody that works very quickly. And, you know, the tricky thing is you have so little time, you have to try and write a melody that, that works within like, you know, five seconds or 20 seconds. And, and so from a musical point of view, that can be quite difficult. And so you can lean more heavily on the sounds, but when you can get them both together, that's like the real, the real gold. But I get so mad at like streaming services, cutting off end credits, so mad that I've even written big articles in the newspaper about it. Um, oh, because yeah. it's a really important part, just as well as the titles, the end credits of a moment of reflection of what you've been to um, totally. on, on the show. And, you know, I love hearing, I love hearing main themes that pay off in a show. You know, you, you tease, you've got the theme at the beginning, but maybe in the last episode, you get the big version or you tease it through the show. I always think that's, that's if you can pull that off as a composer and the directors allow you to do it, it's great. Right, the, love, end titles, yeah, yeah. the end titles are a postscript. I mean, they're such an important part of the story. They still are, even though there's no picture. It's such an important part of it. But yeah, I agree. Keep on writing those articles. <laughs> you should, because they're, it reminded me of actually uh, Queen's Gambit, the score for that. And the, the, the last episode has the, yeah. the incredible main theme at the end. And it's like over like a big main title thing. And it's just, it's like, it brings the whole thing together. I mentioned Queen's Gambit because not in competition with any of your shows this year. So it's a totally, totally <laughs> that, safe. That safe is a great example, right? Because I totally remember watching that whole series. <laughs> Netflix does this thing that drives me mad is you can turn off them, them turning off the credits, right? But on the last episode of a film or a film or a show, they instantly cut it off. And it's like it's the dumbest thing ever because all it does is makes me mad at Netflix or mad at Amazon or whatever. And it's like as a customer, it's like having a great meal, and then someone spitting in your spitting on your plate as, as you finished. You're like, whoa, what have you, why have you done that? I might have finished the food. I feel like I had like one chip left. Uh, <laughs> more than the chip, I don't want to compare it to chip, but um, yeah, it's kind of I, I don't understand why none of the streamers offer a mode. For people who care about stuff to turn it on i get that most people don't care but like the people who do are kind of like why i do my job last one here before we wrap up that's that's great you obviously i feel like the group of you certainly have like a familiarity and camaraderie with each other i feel and you know all like kind of respect your work when you talk to young composers or musicians you know like what kind of what do you tell them about like doing this for a career <clears throat> breton how about you and then we could go around here I don't know. I think for me, it all clicked when I stopped focusing on MIDI and actually started recording stuff myself, like whether it's me playing guitar or, you know, as a lot of other composers on here talked about, like finding sounds that kind of allows you to, you know, world build within within the show. I think that's when it suddenly, you know, things started to fit into place for me. Yeah. Nathan, how about you? Yeah, I mean, just like being unique, you know, like having your own voice as a composer, like there, you, you can, there, there are a number of composers who make a really good living sounding like, you know, generic film music. But I think like just the excitement of like hearing a truly unique identity to someone, someone who spins it in a way that you've never heard before is, is exciting and worth everything. Mm -hmm. Sid, yeah. what do you, what do you think? Yeah. Um, just to piggyback off when Nate said the same thing, you know, it's just, you, I, I mean, I, I always tell people, and it comes from my own experience, I come from the band world, you know, and so I was like, you know, I, I got to, for many years, make records that I wanted to make and didn't care if anybody bought them or not. And it was, you know, and, and people didn't, but, um, but still it was like, I, it, I learned to sort of create my own sounds as much as I could, you know, um, 
down to the drums that we use, the percussion we use. I mean, um, this is us. I'm playing all the percussions on this on a wooden table with my fingers. I'm playing tabla on like a long crate and barrel wooden table. That's the sound of it with my fingers. Sid, you're, you're breaking up again. So unfortunately, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to cut you off and go, we'll go to Daniel here. Daniel, what do you tell people? Um, yeah, I mean, like the, 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 yeah, obviously the number one thing, like we're all saying is like, find your voice, but it's like really hard. I mean, I'm always like, yeah, find your own voice. Because we all know I'm trying to do that half the time. I'm like, oh shit. Um, I, so I think if you're starting out, I think one of the most important things is kind of own your limitations. Do not think you need to get like the world's biggest computer, every single sample library. The more stuff you have, <laughs> the less interesting you're going to be as a composer, I think, because I would actually the, like, I start, when I started doing music, all I had was one synthesizer and a tape player. And I learned how to program that synthesizer better than anything I've ever done since, uh, because it was all I had. And I think there was a, some of that stuff was more interesting than maybe things I'm doing now, because all I had was one thing. And so I would, I would be like, really limit yourself and work out how can you make something work within the limitations, you know, like, Everyone's so obsessed about buying the big sample sets and the big sample libraries and the big computers, but you don't need it. If you can build it yourself, like this is my computer, it's like shit. It's like the little trash can there. That is it. That is it. And I do like all kinds of things on that. And that's the same sort of computer that everyone else has got. Um, so you don't need fancy stuff. You just need fancy ideas. Right. Easier said than done, maybe, but for you guys, maybe not, because all these scores are incredible and all of your work is incredible brett and vivian 1883 on paramount plus nathan barr closer for the great which is on hulu siddhartha kolsla only murders in the building on hulu and this is us on nbc and daniel pemberton welcome to earth and nat geo show you can stream on disney plus and please listen to all your scores as well on spotify and other streaming platforms thank you for doing this it was great chatting with you about the, these scores they're really great thanks, thanks so much